So today I'm going to talk about uh, daylight redirecting films and specifically some case studies. Uh, I had the fortune of working with uh, Lisa and her group on this, and so a lot of credit for uh, specifically the, uh, the measurements and, and uh, computational simulations that, that I'm going to present is, is from her. So she's my partner in crime in this, uh, in this year. Okay, so far uh, the presentation, basically I just want to talk about what the, uh, just give a sh brief introduction, um, the daylight redirecting film, how we characterized it, um, because in the past when they have used, it's, it's always been a very difficult subject. Um, so a little bit about that, and then talk about the field sites, and uh, some site-specific learnings that we did, and then finally wrap up. Okay. So daylighting has been around for forever, uh, and I'm sure many of you have, have seen these pictures, so it's all the way back from, uh, from where the evolution started. And as through the years, as the technology evolved, we went from you know, actually learning or knew how to use daylight into a building space like this, which is uh, at some time we decided, oh, we, we now have electric lighting, we have unlimited resource, we can put light whenever, wherever, in whichever manner we want. But now what was happening is that now we suddenly discovered, oh, that was not all that good. So we need to have daylight because it does m something more than just giving you light. So now the newer buildings are now being designed with, uh, with, with daylight with different products, different ways of doing it. And uh, so, so also, um, you know, as a result of uh, uh, not using daylight, the electric use it, elect or electric intensity in these buildings went up. And now finally, uh, in, the, in the last few years, it's kind of really uh, steadying out. So, so as we said, um, the artificial lighting was, was, was a culprit. And so it's, it always comes back to what we know and what we think we know. And, and so it's a continuous uh, progress, right? So, so the recently we've been again focusing on daylighting, which is the subject of, uh, of this conference. The, in, when, when we think about daylighting, this, we've heard a lot of about how, how the design and what the space is being used for. And common ways of using orienting design, uh, the buildings and, and putting the, the windows where, where we need to. And in, in uh, conjunction with the building design, of course, you have to use products and there are a variety of different things that have been used uh, to better daylight. Just for example, just some of them are there. And they obviously go hand in hand. Uh, but since the focus of this, um, uh, the, the conference here is build old buildings or existing buildings, the daylighting was all great. So especially with the, uh, you know, when we are providing the daylight, especially in the new buildings, we think that we have great daylight, but glare, what about glare? So I don't know how popular Dilbert is and how many of you have had colleagues like Alice uh, and, and got punched, but basically it shows that uh, you know, glare is really the key because people near the window are the ones who really control the amount of daylight. And uh, because whoever has control now controls the, the office. So, um, and uh, this is perfectly uh, shown by the, some of the, one of the sites that we went to. The sunlight is beaming into the space. Well, what do people do? We, we found uh, aluminum foil, we found cardboard, we found you know, paper. Everything is, has been the, that you can think of has been used to block the daylight. So what happened with all this great intention that the architect had in bringing daylight? Well, it was all defeated. Why? Because people were not comfortable. So we need to be able to find um, a solution that is going to be not be able to be defeated and still works in, you know, in, in different circumstances. And daylight redirection is, is obviously is not a new concept. All the way back from, you know, I picked pulled out some patents from 1903, which shows very nicely what, what they've been trying to do is, uh, these are redirecting glass. And over the years, things have changed and the products have become a lot more uh, sophisticated, but the basic fundamental reason why we want to use that has remained the same. So what, uh, what are we trying to do? Because it's, again, existing buildings, there's a lot more existing buildings out there, a lot of them have this problem. And we want to be able to use a film-based thing, something that is very easy to make, easy to apply. And we, uh, being 3M, everything is in a roll form. So if we can roll it out, that's a great 3M product. So roll-to-roll -roll processing is, is important. And eventually it will lead to, you know, more cost-effective uh, cost film or cost-effective products so that it doesn't get designed out 
or it can be retrofitted in a, in, a, uh, in a good manner. The film that we use obviously has, again, that's another 3M thing, everything has to be a glue. So the film has an adhesive on the backside so, so that we can stick it to the, uh, to the window. Now, a little bit about uh, characterization. This is, this is one of the ways that we looked at the film. And uh, it's, a, it's a commercial instrument called Imaging Sphere. Uh, so the film is put in the, uh, into, the, into the machine, and then we, are br we can bring the light in from different angles. So there you can see that the normal incidence, what, how much light is going down. Now we are at 15 degrees. Uh, so at, it, now the film starts working very well. So previously where you saw uh, some of the light was going down, at uh, higher angles, as you go higher and higher, more and more of light is going up towards the ceiling. And that's what we tried to do in our design phase, where we looked at how do you design the prism so that we can most effectively redirect the light onto the ceiling and then diffuse it down. Okay. So here's at uh, 60 degrees. Now, again, more and more light is at, at a higher angle and, and it falls near the window, 75 degrees more light near the window again. So this is, this is how we, uh, we tried to do this. Uh, now, what I, all I showed was just normal incidence, no uh, skew or no skew angles. So when you do this at uh, you know, 145 times, so we can get to the Clems format, so it's 145 by 145 matrix, BSDF could be generated. Then we uh, verified this, the measurements that we did, and both from uh, the, the calculated uh, BSDF standpoint as well as at uh, LBNL using uh, the PG2 uh, Gagne photometer, getting fairly good uh, agreement between, between these results. Especially there's a problem when you've got very high angles, and that's uh, people who work in this area really know that's obviously a big challenge. And Marilyn knows all about it, of course. Um, so what we wanted to do is now that we have uh, a, some, some part of a design that we tried to optimize what is the best overall performance that you can get. Of course, you can optimize for any one particular angle. I can say with great certainty that 100% of the light, I can put it where you want. Give me the angle, I will tell you how much light is going where. But of course, the sun is not stationary, so we want to have, and, and building of, buildings, of course, are not all the same, not all oriented, different latitude, etc. So, so we want to have uh, a, a, uh, the film, now it's been designed, sort of having an overall average best performance. So we, uh, the, then the, the question really becomes, now what happens when you put it into a space, a real space? So we did, we, we were fortunate to have the sponsorship of uh, US Department of Defense, who accepted our proposal saying that, oh, you know, this is a, is a great way of, of reducing energy usage. So let's do these uh, measurements at different sites. And uh, so the, the, uh, the film performance was not only calculated, uh, but also was measured at multiple sites. And through, um, we, we did actual uh, luminance and uh, measurements, and uh, because, uh, as we'll talk and heard before also, glare is, is a major issue, and glare is very difficult to learn and predict uh, through, through the, the, especially the site measurements. So occupant surveys are the next best proxy to that, and so we did that. Um, finally, through simulation, we wanted to find out how much energy savings you could, uh, you could get. And uh, so then uh, assess the effect of, uh, of the uh, redirecting film on energy saving and how satisfied are the occupants with this product. And then finally, to the, the objective is to develop the um, predictive models to see how it's going to work. So for site selection, we wanted to find buildings that have identical or as close as possible treated versus control space side by side. And then uh, we also wanted to have, obviously, have windows to, on, on three different uh, directions and a variety of mixed climate zones. Again, because, we, because we are, our objective was to have um, a, a retrofit product. So we need to have it for, you know, design for how does it work in different climates. That was the objective, right? And the window design also is, plays a major role as well as space. So, so many different factors. So finally, after looking at about 30 or 40 different uh, locations, we settled on six of them for Department of Defense. And then uh, along the way, there was one more extra site that we had a little bit more freedom of where we did some studies. Again, actually, Lisa and her group did most of the work there. So my job was to just to install the film, and I said bye. Um, 
so those are the sites where we looked at, and uh, it's, it's interesting to see how it's mapped out over the, uh, the, the overall um, energy availability, so or the solar energy available. So you can see that there is a bunch of climate, uh, the, the sunny areas as well as sort of mixed climate that we looked at. Uh, so they are, uh, as I said, they are scattered across different climate zones. The way we installed it is, uh, you know, there's a film that goes on the existing window. There are a couple different methods that we had to do. Again, we had to adapt to what the sites really th threw at us, because we, this, again, being retrofit, never know what, what you're going to get. So what we ended up happening uh, was there is a film, and as we uh, learned through the process is that at certain angles, uh, the, there is a small amount of light that is redirected down due to imperfections in the film. So that can be, uh, result in extremely bad glare. So how do you get rid of that? A simple way to do that was to put a diffuser in front. And that the, the amount of redirected uh, light down is only a few percent, anything from you know, 1 to 7 percent. But sun being so bright, it ends up as a very bright source in, in, in your eye. So once you put the diffuser in front, then that sort of column goes away. This is the way that we chose to do it in several of these sites. Then when we got to a couple other ones, well, we found something different. The window design was, very, was not amenable at all to that sort of installation. So this, this is a site in Monterey. We got, go, uh, went there and found out that, oh, somebody had the sun control film, were not happy with it, tried to tear it out, were not successful, gave it up. So, so this is just, uh, just examples of some of the things that you find when you try to do field studies in existing buildings with real people, real, uh, real structures. So, the, so we had to adapt again using a, a magnetic strip to, to put the film in, in one portion of the window and then using uh, a self-mating fastener to, to put it in the another one. So that's just, again, give, giving you an example of uh, how we tried to overcome some of these challenges. The, uh, the luminance measurements were taken at both at the ceiling levels and as also at the desk level, also looked at the compared to uh, how much light is incident on the window. So all these uh, lots and lots of, uh, of data was taken. And because there's now, now the, the hard, easy part was really collecting the data. Now trying to analyze that and making sense of it from these different sites was obviously challenging. So today, I'm just going to show, uh, uh, we'll condense it down and t talk about the data just from uh, Norfolk, Virginia here. This is the building, and we installed the film up here in this uh, top floor. And the space kind of looks like this. There is a, uh, a recessed or dropped ceiling, which is at an angle sloping down. So very well designed, designed for daylighting. But what you see from, let's see, from the previous graph is if you look at the windows, and, and notice that all the, every single uh, room or every single window has a shade halfway down at least. Well, obviously that points to the glare problem. And uh, so they, they were not very happy when they looked at our proposal. They wanted to see, uh, show me this actual sample. So we had to do a, a test install for these, uh, these two bays there. So you can see that the, the, how the light is getting redirected up to the ceiling and there's no film here, uh, it's, it's much less bright. So now this is com coming to the data that we collected. The film, what we found out that is, is at three different uh, you know, depths from, uh, the, um, uh, from the window. It works very well during the winter. You can get anything from, this is in foot candles, so I apologize for, for the data here, or the, the units, but so it's, it's 200 lux, 35 feet from from the window in winter time. And uh, so, so this is plotted as a, as a solar azimuth. And uh, but, but in summertime, you don't get as much improvement in uh, illuminance. However, when you actually look at the number, you know, 100 lux or 100 uh, is, is not that bad. It's uh, quite a bit. It's, again, we're talking about 35 feet from, from the window. So it's working quite well. Now, looking at solar elevation, again, so the same data plotted differently shows that uh, it wor works very well in winter. Uh, backing, backing to summer as a function of uh, solar elevation, looking at the same data differently, it's, uh, you know, summer is, was not as effective. So up to 20 uh, foot candle in, uh, uh, increase over that, and this is now comparison with a non-treated window up to 35 feet from the back and near the window in, in winter time, you're getting a lot more illuminance. 
Okay, so coming to the glare, uh, so we had to do use a resort to, uh, to, to surveys. So three of these sites, everybody was uh, reporting pretty much a uh, improvement in, uh, in the luminance without, the affection, uh, without affecting glare. So you can see that in, in this 29 Palms site, which was where I showed you the pictures earlier, earlier where people had put up the um, uh, you know, paper and everything on the windows, you saw maximum improvement in the, in the uh, scale, of, uh, in, in Likert scale, four points improvement. But in summer, there was a, a negative impact. But now remember that that, that was for a different, uh, uh, perhaps, the set of people that we, we surveyed because this was, these were soldiers kind of really moving around. And so what this is really, the data is showing is that there is not a big, big problem in glare that we are, uh, we are seeing in these spaces. So I'm going to speed up now, coming to uh, the, the earlier topic today about how to measure uh, the luminance or the, uh, the daylight metrics. So daylight autonomy plots are shown here. Uh, this is the space that was modeled, a simple box with clear story window up on top. And um, so control space versus treated space. This is the case where the blinds are open. Not much of a difference that you can see. Well, uh, but, but then once the blinds are closed, now you can see a huge difference between the treated space versus control space. So obviously, and then when the, space, uh, the, uh, the blinds are automated, the, the answer is something in between. So the real, uh, so th this can be now taken into uh, daylight autonomy plots for different uh, climate zones as well as different orientation. So you see the maximum benefit that you can see from uh, in, in the south facing window, obviously. And uh, the daylight autonomy is uh, so the same metric that was 300 lux metric was used here for the from IES uh, method. So go pretty good improvement in, in, uh, in the daylight autonomy as a use of uh, the daylighting film. One way to, to think about this is that uh, by having the daylight redirecting film in the clear story window, now there is uh, no glare and people cannot defeat or don't have the need to really defeat the measure. So it sort of looks, uh, you know, uh, one way to think of it is the insurance policy. If you have daylighting sensors and, and control systems, they are going to give you the savings that you think you're going to get. So talking about savings now, because it's, it's a complex system, we had to uh, resort to the sort of what, what can you expect? There is a minimum or maximum because the people are going to be, it it's really depends upon how the blinds are used. So not bad number. These are the, the, the numbers over what you would expect if you just had photo controls in the space. So up to anywhere from half a, a kilowatt hour per square foot to anything from one and a half in, in these spaces in terms of lighting energy use, and then convert it to both peak and, and uh, whole energy savings, so significant saving that you can achieve. So, so to summarize, basically we uh, designed and, and installed a film and studied it in, uh, at several different spaces. Overall results were kind of same, but every site had slight peculiarities, so the results could not be directly compared. But the, the, the basic message still remains the same. The daylighting film really works as designed. So, so our, our uh, assumptions in, in designing it were confirmed. And uh, so uh, the, the glare, glare was really not turned, uh, a major problem. The, the nature of the survey and, and the occupant profile, etc. when you look at it, the surveys, so it's, it's very difficult to make definitive conclusion. But again, what all we are trying to say is that the, it doesn't appear to be a major, major issue. So before I uh, finish up, I want to acknowledge uh, Department of Defense for, for providing the funding for this. And uh, along the, uh, the lines, and, you know, we had help in, uh, from many different uh, colleagues around the world. So, and, and so that's it. Uh, thank you.